particular. Is there a creature in the whole country but ourselves that doesn't take a trip to the town every now and then to rub off the rust a little? There's the two Miss Hogs and our neighbor Mrs. Grigsby go to take a month's polishing every winter. Aye, uh, and bring back vanity and affection to last in the whole year. I wonder why London can't keep its own fools at home. In my day, the follies of the town crept slowly among us. But now they travel faster than a stagecoach. Their fopperies come down not only as inside passengers, but in the very baskets. Aye, your times were fine times indeed. You've been telling us of them for many a long year. Here we live in an old rumbling mansion. Therefore, the world looks like an inn, but that we never see company. Now the best visitors are Ill Mrs. Oldfish, the curate's wife, and Crookgate, the lame dancing master. And all our entertainment, your old stories of Prince Eugene and the Duke of Marlborough. I hate such old-fashioned trumpery. And I love it. I love everything that's old. Old friends, old times, old manners, old books, old wine. And I do believe, don't feel alone, that I've been quite fond of an old wife. Lord, Mr. Hardcastle, you're forever at your Dorothy's and your old wife's. You may be a Darby, but I'll be no Joan, I promise you. I'm not so old as you'd make me by at least one good year. Add twenty to twenty and make money of that. Let me see. Twenty and to twenty makes just fifty and seven. <gasps> it's false, Mr. Hardcastle. Why, I was but twenty when I was brought to bed at Tony, had by Mr. Lumpkin, my first husband. He's not yet reached the age of discretion. Nor ever will. I dare speak for him. Aye, you have taught him finally. No matter. Tony Lumpkin has a good fortune. My son is not to live by his learning. I don't think a boy needs much learning to spend fifteen hundred a year. Learning cause a, a mere composition of tricks and mischief. Humor, my dear. Nothing but humor. Come, Mr. Hardcastle, you must allow the boy a little humor. I'd sooner allow him a horse pond. Oh. If burning the footman's shoes, scaring the maids, and terrorizing the kittens be humor, he has it. It was just yesterday he fastened my wig to the back of my chair, and when I stood to bow, I popped me bald head in Mrs. Bristle's face. <laughs> and am I to blame? The poor boy was always too sickly to do any good. A school would be his death. Perhaps when he comes to be a little stronger, who knows what a year two's Latin will do for him? Latin for him? A cat and fiddle? No, no. The yeah, house and the stable are the only two schools he'll ever go to. Well, we mustn't snub the poor boy. For I believe we shan't have him with us long. Anybody can look at his face and see who's consumptive. Ah, if we're only too fat, we want the symptoms. <laughs> he coughs sometimes. Yes, when his liquor goes down the wrong way. I'm actually afraid of his lungs. And truly, so am I. For sometimes he whoops like a steam trumpet. Hey, hello, hello, hello. Oh, there he goes. Tell me. Mother, where are you going? Mother, I'm in haste. Oh, I cannot stay. This fat pigeons expect me down every moment. There's some fun going forward. A low poultry set of fellows. Not so low, neither. There's Dick Muggins, the exciseman. Little Aminadab, who spins a, the pewter platter. Tom Twist, who grinds the music box. And Jack Slim, the horse doctor. Pray, my dear, disappoint them for one night. Alice, for disappointing them, I, I, I really can't abide that, but and I can't abide to disappoint myself either. Oh, you shan't go. I will, I tell you. Well, I say you We'll see which is strongest, you or I. Oh! Uh, there goes the man who will only spoil his jobs. <laughs> but is not the whole age in a combination to drive a sense of discretion out the doors? For instance, my pretty darling Kate. The fashions of the times have almost infected her, too. By living a year or two in town, she is as fond of gauze and French frippery as the best of them. Blessings on my pretty innocence, dressed out as usual by Kate. Goodness, what a superfluous amount of silk hast thou got about thee, girl. I can never teach the fools of this age that the indigent world can be clothed out of the trimmings of the veil. You know I'll agree it, sir. You allow me the morning to receive and pay visits and to dress my own way. And in the evening, I put on my housewife's dress to please you. Remember, I insist on the terms of our agreement, and by the by, I believe I shall have occasion to try your obedience this very evening. I protest, sir. I don't comprehend your meaning. Let's be plain with you, Kate. 
I expect the young gentleman I chose to be your husband from town this very day. I have his father's letter, in which he informs me his son has set out, and that he intends to follow himself shortly after. Bless me. I wish I had never been sooner. How shall I behave? It's a thousand to one I shan't like him, as I'll meet him with so formal and so like a thing of business. I shall find no room for friendship or esteem. Depend upon it, child. I shall never control your choice. But Mr. Marlowe, whom I have pitched upon, is the son of my old friend, Sir Charles Marlowe, of whom you've heard me talk so often. The young gentleman has been bred as a scholar and is designed for employment in the service of his country. I'm told he's a man of an excellent understanding. Very generous. <coughs> young and brave. I'm sure I shall like him. Very handsome. My dear Papa, say no more. He's mine. I'll have him. And to crown all Kate, he's one of the most bashful but savage young fellows in all the world. You have frozen me to death again. That word reserved has undone all the rest of his accomplishments. A reserved lover, it is said, is always made for a suspicious husband. On the contrary, modesty seldom resides in a breast that is not enriched with noble virtues. It's the very feature in his character that most struck me. You must have more striking features to catch me, I assure you. But if you be so young, so handsome, and so everything as you've mentioned, I believe you'll do so. I'll have him. I agree, but there is still an obstacle. There's more than an even way to keep not have you. My dear Papa, why will you mortify one so? Well, if he refuses, instead of breaking my heart to his indifference, I'll merely break my glass for its factory. Set my cap to some newer fashion in the box and the less difficult admirer. Bravely resolved. In the meantime, I'll go and prepare the servants for his reception. As we seldom see company, they want as much training as a company of recruits the first day's muster. Yeah, that. <gasps> this music for Paz has an old and young and brave. These he put last, but I put them foremost. Sensible and good natured, I like all that, but bashful and reserved, so that's much against him. But can't he be cured of his timidity by, by being taught to be proud of his wife? Yes, and can't he? But I vow, I'm disposing of a husband before I've secured the mother. Constance, I'm so glad you came. Tell me, how do I look today? Is there anything whimsical about me? Am I in face today, child? Perfectly, my dear. Yet yeah, bless me. Sure, no accident has not happened among the canary birds or the goldfishes. No. Has your brother, Captain Medley? No. Has the last novel been too moving? <laughs> no, no, no. Nothing of all that. Well, I've been threatened. I can see as we love. Come on. I've been threatened with a lover. Is Marlowe indeed yes, the son of Sir Charles Marlowe, the most intimate friend of my admirer, Mr. Hastings? They have never asunder. I'm sure you must have seen him when we lived in town. Never. He is a very singular character, I assure you. Among women of modesty and virtue, he's the modestest man alive. But his acquaintances give him different. Character among creatures of a different stamp. You understand me? Oh, an odd character indeed. I shall never be able to manage him. What shall I do? Sure, think no more of it, but trust your courage for success. But how long your own affairs, my dear? Has my mother been caught to you for my brother Tony as usual? I have just come from one of our agreeable tenants. She's been saying a hundred tender things and setting off for pretty monster. It's very pink of perfection. Her partiality is such that she actually thinks him so. Besides, a fortune like yours is no small temptation. As she has sole management of it, I'm not surprised to see her now be manipulated out of the family. A fortune like mine, which chiefly consists in jewels, is no such mighty temptation. But if my dear Hastings be the constant, I make no doubt to prove too hard for her at last. I let her suppose that I am in love with her son, and she never once dreams that 
but my affections fixed on her. My brother holds out so stoutly. I could have his love him for hating you so. It is a good-natured creature. At bottom, and I'm sure would wish to see me marry to anybody but himself. Yes. But my aunt's bell rings for our afternoon's walk around the improvements.